Hello, Egrishan Radio listeners, and welcome to Airtime of the Geek. And it's a happy Easter Monday to all of you who are listening live. I'm coming, and I'm all alone in the office today, just me and my music, so there'll be none of Tony's chicken dance nonsense or anything like that. It's all decent music today. It's Monday, and it's 1pm GMT, if you're listening live via our website or via TuneIn. If you're listening to the 1am repeat, it's 5pm Pacific, 7pm Central and 8pm Eastern. Comments, queries, suggestions, you can follow me on Twitter at AirtimeGeek or Instagram at AirtimeOfTheGeek. You can email me, paulab at ignitionradio.co.uk or you can call in the studio, the number is 01642 645 827. I am logged into my Twitter account and my email account and I'll be answering the phone. So anyone who wants to call in, please do so. I've started a new thing on my Instagram where I am taking pictures of my daily geek shirt so everyone can enjoy them. I do try to wear a completely different shirt every day. I have a quite a large t-shirt collection. It drives my mother crazy. Um, I've also started a Deviant Art account and my name on there is Airtime Geek. You can watch me if you want to see artwork I upload there. It's the 28th of March, which means it's 27 days until Game of Thrones Season 6 airs. Less than a month, people. 27 days. That's all we've got to wait. Apologies if you tuned in last week. Technical difficulties delayed the show, so it had to be postponed until this week. However, it is the same show that I intended to air last week. Let's do a double dose of the geek news. Great news. The Crow remake is off again. We can all celebrate that a movie that was already perfect isn't being remade unnecessarily. It's lost its director and its main star. So, huzzah! Apparently, there's going to be an Indiana Jones 5. Uh, yay? I've never been that fussed on the indie films. Sorry, guys. It's just, it's something I've never really been that bothered about. They're a little bit generic. I mean, they're fun, but mm, it's not Star Trek. Robert Downey Jr. has said that he's unsure if there will be an Iron Man 4. Robert, if you're listening, there needs to be an Iron Man 4. Do you hear me? Are you listening to me, Robert? Iron Man 4 needs to happen. Yes, Civil War draws ever closer, and I've already booked my tickets to go and see. We'll be there, usual seats, front row, me, the bestie. I'll be in a Coulson t-shirt. I'll also be wearing one Cap sock, one Iron Man sock. I am not Team Cap. I am not Team Iron Man. I am Team Sexy Times. The director of the movie has actually said that Civil War is a love story between Steve and Bucky. So I think it's fair to infer from that that Tony is the spurned lover and let them make up naked in hot tub. Naked hot tub sexy times. Netflix is still on for adapting a series of unfortunate events and Patrick Warburton has been cast as Lemony Snicket, the narrator, which is why he won't be involved in the upcoming Tick series. However, Peter Serafinowicz the voice of Darth Maul himself and hilarious comedian has been announced to star as the big blue hero. So I am super excited about that. I will literally watch anything with Peter Serafinowicz in it. And it took me a real long night time to uh, learn how to pronounce his name. So I will say it very often. The Westworld TV series moves ever forward to a resounding cries of Neh? and why Abrams? Why? How much mileage can you actually get out of a Yul Brynner robot going mental? I don't, I don't know how you can make a whole series of that. I mean, the film is pretty scary. That's part of the reason I have robot fear, but I don't know how you can drag out an entire TV series out of it. Batman v Superman has opened two terrible reviews. See my lack of surprise. Making everything grey and dull and convoluted does not make a good movie. Zack Snyder, the man who ruined the X-Men trilogy with that awful third instalment. Ugh. I have finally got caught up on all my programmings, so I finally managed to get a chance to get started on Netflix Daredevil Season 2. I'm only two episodes in, and I have to say that it either seems to be, like, a much lower budget than last season, or the guy who does the lighting should be shot, 
because it looks like it's being filmed on someone's iPhone. So far, my opinion is could use less Punisher. I hate the Punisher. I find it hard to find anything likeable about a character whose thing is, ooh, let's go murder people because of the reason. Plenty of other heroes have tragic buck stories, but don't go around murdering everyone in sight. See Batman, Spider-Man, Superman. Look, basically everyone except Deadpool and he actually gets paid to kill people. Finn Jones, better known to Game of Thrones fans as Loras Tyrell, has been cast as Marvel's Iron Fist as part of the Netflix M MCU canon TV shows. A word on these shows, please. Um, when you show the New York skyline, include the Stark Tower. It's driving me cray cray. Why are you acting so cray cray? One of my favourite movies of all time, Heathers, is being made into a TV series. Now, Heathers, if you haven't seen it, is about a girl who goes on a little bit of a murder spree. Um, she, well, she makes friends with this bad boy at school who's all like dark and mysterious and they start killing people, possibly by accident. It's, it's a very clever movie. But when I heard they were doing a remake, I was like, wow, they really can't do this. Not in the modern age with like school shootings in the wake of like Columbine. It still resonates with us. You, you just can't. However, when I read the description, it actually piqued my curiosity majorly. Um, here's what TV Land had to say about it. TV Land's take is described as a black comedy that takes place in the present day. It features a new set of popular yet evil Heathers, only this time the outcasts have become high school royalty. Heather McNamara, originally played by Lisanne Falk, is a black lesbian. Heather Duke, who was originally played by Shannon Doherty, is a male who identifies as genderqueer, whose real name is Heath. And Heather Chandler, originally played by Kim Walker, who actually sadly passed away from brain tumour, has a body like Martha Dump Truck. Uh, we know now for definite that Guillermo del Toro won't be directing Pacific Rim 2 and instead has been linked with the remake of Fantastic Voyage, which is a bit like Inner Space, only it's older than Inner Space. Um, personally, I'd rather see Guillermo del Toro take another go at the kaijus because they were awesome. But, you know, he's wouldn't want to do Fantastic Voyage actually for years and years and years. And I love him. I'm sure it'll be fantastic. The big Supergirl Flash crossover is coming up. Thanks to hints to the multiverse in The Flash, perhaps we'll get to see Barry's dad don the Flash costume yet. Fans of the show know, obviously, that the actor who plays Barry's dad in the show was the original Flash in the 90s show. Recently, they announced that... Wonder Woman herself, Linda Carter, will guest star in Supergirl as the American president. Yay for all the good things that Supergirl's doing, except for Jimmy. Jimmy is behaving like a douche nozzle in the show. Can you please stop doing that? Thanks, sure. Also, I'm so, so tired of the island flashbacks on Arrow and the whole Oliver Felicity will they, won't they, make a decision and stick to it. And then stop shoving it down our throats and get on with the interesting superheroing. While we're on the subject, though, this week I read an article about diversity in the casting of superheroes. It's far too white and, in my opinion, far too male. The movies aren't all that diverse and I've already spoken about my displeasure for yet another white Peter Parker Spider-Man instead of giving Miles Morales a try. The Shaws, though. The Shaws. They're the ones that are branching out into more diversity. S.H.I.E.L.D., Carter, Arrow, Flash, Supergirl, Legends of Tomorrow, they're all far more diverse in their casting of both people of colour and women, traditionally in white or male roles. And so far, I think that they deserve a huge clap on the back because they're doing really good things. We've got a female Speedy. We've got a really diverse cast on Arrow. We've got a really diverse cast on Flash. Just on S.H.I.E.L.D., all about the diversity. I'm, I couldn't praise them more for it. Some American gods news. Joining that bloke out of Hollyoaks, who's been cast as Shadow, the fantabulous Ian McShane has been cast as Mr. Wednesday, and Emily Browning as Laura Moon. I honestly cannot wait to, for this adaptation to hit the small screen. American Gods is one of my favourite books of all time. Love it, love it, love it. 
Three other actors have been cast too in smaller parts. I'm waiting though to hear who's been cast as Shadow's cellmate, which I won't say his name because spoilers, if you've read the book you know who I'm talking about, but that part has me super excited. Finally, huge squee. Cannot in fact contain my squee. Marvel is commissioning a series, a new series, a new TV series to add to the MCU. What is it? Captain Britain. Yes, there's a Captain Britain. Captain Britain and MI13 is one of the best Marvel series ever written. Often stated that Captain Britain is the British equivalent of Captain America. People who've actually read the top comics will tell you that Brian Braddock gets his powers from mystical means. And Captain America's real British equivalent is Captain Midlands. Captain Midlands is a patriotic British war veteran and right-wing analogue of Captain America. He's 80 years old. He's a brummy. He's often portrayed as a grumpy it. His real name, Rambling Sid Ridley, is a combination of Kenneth Williams' Round the Horn character, Rambling Sid Rumpaw, and Arnold Ridley, prayed by G Private Godfrey in the sitcom Dad's Army. Captain Midland's strength, speed, stamina, reflex, agility, dexterity, coordination, balance and endurance are at the highest limits of natural superhero potential, despite the fact that he's an 80-year-old man that still has a body of a superhero. That's right. He is an 80-year-old brummy who's a superhero. He's like Cap if he had aged. It's It's absolutely fantastic. Anyone who's never read the Captain Britain comics... Look them up online. If you can't get hard copies, go to Comicology, buy the, the digital versions, read them on your iPad, smartphone, whatever. The comic reader is really easy to use. You can just swipe through the panels. Very convenient. Brilliant characters. Brilliant. I mean, you've not just got Captain Britain. You've got Spitfire, Moon Knight, uh, Union Jack, um, Jack Flag. Fantastic, fantastic characters. Cannot wait to see a Captain Britain series. Hoping that somehow this might actually get tied into Marvel's Most Wanted because anyone, <clears throat> again, who's read the comics knows that the character of Hunter from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. who's moving over to Marvel's Most Wanted with Bobby Moss is actually the founder of Strike, which is the British equivalent of S.H.I.E.L.D. So... Maybe Marvel's Most Wanted is going to kickstart the whole Captain Britain revolution. We'll have to wait and see. So I'm going to play a song now and then we're going to do shout outs and this week's top 10. That was Peter Gabriel, The Book of Love. Comments, query, suggestions. Follow me on Twitter at Airtime Geek or Instagram at Airtime of the Geek. Email me, paulaby at ignitionradio.co.uk or you can call in the studio 01642 645 Eight two seven. I've got my Twitter page open. I've got the emails open. Phone's right next to me. I will answer. So if you want to get involved with the show, please do so. So it's time. Oh, wait. Shout outs. Got to do shout outs. Uh, big hugs to Brave Sir Robin, of course, for being wonderful and lovely. And I'm very, very sorry that there was technical difficulties last week. And a big, big smooch to lovely, lovely Mark. Keep telling them about the show and occasionally maybe you could offer take me to Lickety Splits. I like ice cream too, just saying. So it's time for this week's top 10 and this week we are counting down my top 10 sci-fi shows set in space. Why be so specific? Well, I'm a huge sci-fi fan and... Most people who aren't really into it think that sci-fi is exclusively shows like Star Trek, but it really does cover a litany of different genres. Um, sci-fi shows set in the future, sci-fi shows set in a not-too-distant future. Sci-fi is like a sort of steampunk, so this week we're just looking at sci-fi shows set in space. So, we'll start, as usual, at number 10, because it's more fun for me. Number 10 is Space Precinct. Space Precinct was a British-American TV series that was broadcast from 94 to 95 on Sky 1 and then later on BBC 2 in the UK and its first run syndication in the United States. Many US stations scheduled the show late night time slots which resulted in low ratings and contributed to its cancellation. 
The series was created by Jerry Anderson of Thunderbirds and Captain Scarlet fame. And it was a mix of science fiction and police procedural that combined many elements with previous series like Space 1999, uh, UFO, with like a dash of Law and Order and Dragnet. Anderson was the executive producer with Tom Gutteridge. One of the series directors was John Glenn, who had previously directed five James Bond movies, including the ones starring the very best James Bond, Timothy Dalton. The series is set in 2040 and starred an American actor, Ted Shackelford, as former NYPD detective Patrick Broden. Now a uh, lieutenant with the Demeter City Police Force on the planet Altor in the Epsilon Eridani system. Brogan and his partner Jack Haldane, played by Rob Youngblood, must adjust to living in another solar system and investigating crimes committed by aliens as well as humans. It also co-starred Danish actress Simone Bendix as Officer Jane Castle, Haldane's love interest, Brogan being happily married with a wife and daughter and son when he moved to Demeter City. All other major characters were played by actors in complex makeup that included elements of puppetry in order to depict the different alien races. The idea of Space Precinct actually predated the series by nearly a decade. In 1986, Anderson produced Space Police, which was like a 55-minute pilot that featured Anderson regular Shane Rimmer as broken. Uh, the series failed to sell at the time and the pilot was never broadcast. It's since circulated on video and online and features many differences. Uh, Brogan's a much older character than that played by Shackelford. He's a bachelor. His partner, who is the only other apparently human character in the pilot, is Sergeant Kathy Costello, who is revealed to be an android capable of shifting between human and a more robotic-like appearance. The aliens featured in the pilot are cat-like, um, and the only character other than Brogan to transfer from the pilot is the robot Slow-Mo. The pilot, which is much more comedic in nature than the somewhat serious series that followed combined live action, full-size prosthetics, puppetry and super macromatic animation techniques. I was a pretty average watcher as a kid, having been born on bread on sci-fi shows. Uh, I had a few of the books uh, and annuals that were made and was fairly disappointed when it wasn't renewed. I really enjoyed this program. I think it was a great so sort of family sci-fi show. Sometimes some of the sci-fi shows I think are far too adult or far too for children. And this was a really great mix for sort of both generations to sit down and watch. And I think by far it was probably one of the most ambitious British sci-fi shows ever to be produced. So what I'm going to play now is the Space Precinct opening titles. Number nine is Hyperdrive. Hyperdrive was a British TV series and it was a sitcom and it was broadcast on BBC Two in 2006-2007. The working title of it was Full Power. Um, it starred Nick Frost, Miranda Hart and Kevin Eldon. And in a 2008 interview, Eldon commented that he considered the third series was unlikely to be commissioned. It's set in the years 2151 and 2152, and it follows the crew of the HMS Candom Lock as they stumble through their heroic mission to protect British interests in a changing galaxy. The Camden Lock is a Wendover-class ship headed by the eager yet hopelessly naive Captain Michael Henderson, and his crew is made up of the psychopathic Eduardo York, the shy and timid Chloe Teal, the neurotic Dave Vine, the disobedient Carl Jeffers, and robotic girl Sandstrom, who is in charge of flying the ship. They are charged with the mission of exploring new worlds, but because of how hilariously incompetent all the characters are, they usually end up making their problems bigger until they go away. The show frequently parodies its source material, lampshading and making fun of many tropes and conventions that are a part of speculative fiction. Uh, the design for the HMS Candom Lock was loosely based upon the BT Tower, and the ship's registration is XH. 558, which is the same serial number as the last flying Avro Vulcan bomber. The shuttle bay doors on the Camden are shown with the Union Jack embossed on them, which is part of the proudly British theme of the series. And the Camden lock, of course, is the same name as a lock in the real Camden in London. It's one of those shows that's been 
really vastly underappreciated and it was probably missed by many people on the basis that the Beeb didn't particularly advertise it and as quickly as it came it was cancelled but it starred a lot of great actors really funny people and I highly recommend it if you've got like some free time to sit and watch 12 episodes of a really funny sci-fi comedy show watch Hyperdrive. That was Kill the Humans from Hyperdrive. So, number eight on my countdown of the best sci-fi shows set in space is Blake 7. Blake 7 was a British sci-fi show produced by the Beeb for broadcast on BBC One. Four 13-episode series of Blake 7 were broadcast between 1978 and 1981, and it was created by Terry Nation, who also created the Daleks for Doctor Who. Blake 7 was popular from its first broadcast and was watched by approximately 10 million people in the UK and shown in 25 other countries. Though, you know, I might point out that at the time there was only four channels in the UK. Just saying. Although many tropes of space opera are present such as spaceships, robots, galactic empires and aliens, its budget was completely inadequate for its interstellar narrative and it remains well regarded for its strong characterisation, ambiguous morality and pessimistic tone. Critical responses to the programme have been polarised. Reviewers praised it as its dystopian themes and its enormous sense of fun and broadcaster Clive James said it was classically awful. A limited range of Blake 7 merchandise was issued, uh, books, magazines, annuals were published, the BBC released music and sound effects from the series, several companies made Blake 7 toys and models, four video compilations were released between 1985 and 1990, the entire series was released on video cassettes starting in 91 and re-released in 97, and it was subsequently released on four DVD box sets. <clears throat> the BBC produced two audio dramas in 98 and 99 which features some of the original cast members and they were broadcast on Radio 4 and although pr proposals for a live action and animated remake have not been realised Blake 7 has been revived with two series of official audio dramas and a comedic short film as well as a series of fan-made audio plays and a proposed series of official novels the series, if you've not seen it, is set in the future age of interstellar travel and follows exploits of a group of renegades and convicted criminals. Gareth Thomas plays the eponymous character Roge Blake, a political dissident who is arrested and tried and convicted on false charges and then deported from Earth to a prison planet. He and two fellow prisoners, treated as expendable, are sent to board and investigate an abandoned alien spacecraft. They get the ship working, commandeer it, rescue two more prisoners and are joined by an alien gorilla with telepathic uh, powers. In their attempts to stay ahead of their enemies and others to rebel, they encounter a wide variety of cultures on different planets and are forced to confront human and alien threats. The group conducts a campaign against the totalitarian Tendon Federation until an intergalactic war occurs. Blake disappears and Kerr Avon then leads the group. When the spaceship is destroyed and another group member dies, they commandeer an inferior craft and a base on a distant planet, far from where they continue their campaign. In the final episode, famously, Avon finds Blake, suspecting him of betraying the group, kills him, and then the group is shot by Federation guards who surround Avon in the final scene. Avon steps over Blake's body, raises his gun, and smiles. It's one of those famous everyone dies in the end moments, and that's where it comes from. Blake's seven legacy to future TV and film space opera was the use of moral ambiguity, dysfunctional main characters to create tension and the long-term story arcs to aid cohesiveness. These devices can be seen in Babylon 5, Lex, Andromeda, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Farscape, Firefly and the reimagined Battlestar Galactica. These programmes contrast with the simple good versus evil dualism of Star Wars or the feel-good tone of unconnected episode structure of both early Star Trek and the series main contemporary Doctor Who. In July 2012, Deadline reported that a remake for US television networks was being developed by an independent studio, George Phil Television. On the 22nd of August, Sci-Fi Network announced that Joe Pulaski would develop the series with Martin Campbell and would direct the new remake. In 2013, the BBC reported a new series of Blake 7 would appear on Sci-Fi. Other media reported that a full series of 13 episodes had been placed. 
However, you know, it's 2016 now. It still hasn't arrived. It's probably not going to happen. But please enjoy the Blake 7 theme tune. So that, of course, was the theme tune for Blake 7. <clears throat> Continuing on with our countdown of the top 10 sci-fi shows set in space is a little show known as Mystery Science Theatre 3000. Yeah, so the reason I played the theme tune first rather than at the end is because I've got a lot to say about Mystery Science Theatre and I'm playing another song at the end. So basically, I just want to plug Mystery Science Theatre as much as possible. Um, so Mystery Science Theatre 3000 is otherwise known as MST3K. It was an American television comedy series created by Joel Hodgson and produced by Best Brains Inc., the show premiered on KTMA in Minneapolis, Minnesota, on November the 24th, 1988, and it later aired on the Comedy Channel slash Comedy Central for another six seasons until its cancellation in 1997. Through a fan-driven write-in campaign, the show was picked up by the Sci-Fi Channel and aired for another three seasons until its final cancellation in 1999. The series ran for 11 years with 197 episodes and one feature film. A plan to revive the series was launched in 2015 by Hodgson and um, Shout Factory, who helped secure the licensing rights for the MSTK brand, <laughs> uh, which helped uh, acquire the license for the MST3K brand and for past MST. 3K episodes for home media and online streaming. The revival, based on crowdsourced Kickstarter funding, is expected to include 14 new episodes starring Jonah Ray as the new human test subject aboard the Satellite of Love, with Felicia Day and Patent Oswalt as the new Mads. The show initially starred Hodgson as Joel Robinson, a janitor trapped against his will by two mad scientists on the Satellite of Love and forced to watch a series of B-movies as a part of the scientist's plot to take over the world. To keep his sanity, Joel crafts a number of robot companions, which include Tom Servo, Crotty Robot and Gypsy, to keep him company and help him humorously comment on each movie as it plays, a process known as riffing. Each two-hour episode would feature a single movie in its entirety, with Joel, Tom and Crow watching in silhouette from a row of theatre seats at the bottom of the screen and also included initial sketches. The show's cast changed over its duration. Most notably, Joel was replaced by Mike Nelson in the show's fifth season. Other cast members, most of whom were also writers for the show, included uh, Trace Bulow, uh, Josh Weinstein, Jim Mallon, Kevin Murphy, Frank Conniff, Mary Jo Pearl, Bill Corbett, Paul Chaplin and Bridget Jones Nelson. Following the show's cancellation, cast members went on to form their own projects, including Riff Tracks, which sees Mike, Kevin and Bill reunite to riff on contemporary movies via MP3s that can be synced with the film. You can even buy the pre-synced version of Kula's Ice, the vanilla ice movie, on iTunes. Um, there's a sort of thing with the fans, do you like Mike? Do you like Joel? Um, I like Mike better. I was introduced to the show through the Sci-Fi Channel. The Joel episodes weren't really aired in the UK. It was just the Mike episodes, and we only got three seasons of it. The actual the Sci-Fi era was pretty much the era that we got in the UK, and it only saw further episodes um, thanks to the wonderful magic of internet downloads. MST 3K is set in the not too distant future. Two mad scientists, Dr. Clayton Forrester and his sidekick, Dr. Lawrence Earhart, launch Joel Robinson, a janitor working for the Gizmonic Institute, into space aboard the orbiting dog bone shaped satellite of love. Forrester and Earhart, collectively referred as the Mads on the shore, operate the satellite of love from their secret Deep 13 underground base and force Joel to watch a series of B-movies in order to pinpoint the perfect B-movie to use as a weapon in Dr. Forrester's scheme of world domination. Cambot is the silent recorder of the experiments. Magic Voice, a disembodied female voice offering various announcements during the segment of the show. Rocket Number 9... Uh, a camera external bot to film the, site, uh, the satellite includes some of the other robots on the show. 
Joel has no control of when the movies start because he used the parts would allow him to do so to build the robots. He must enter the theatre when the movie is sent up because the Mads have numerous ways to punish Joel for non-compliance, including shutting off the oxygen supply to the rest of the ship and electric shocks. As the movie plays, Joel, Tom Servo and Crow wisecrack and mock the movie, a practice known as riffing to prevent themselves from going mad. Over the course of the show's run, there were several cast changes with the narrative often adjusted to match. When Weinstein left the show after the first season, Kevin Murphy replaced him as the voice of Tom Servo, well, Tom Servo while TV's Frank replaced Dr. Weinstein's, uh, sorry, Weinstein's Dr. Earhart as Dr. Forrester's lackey. <clears throat> Hodgson departed the series halfway through the fifth season and head writer Michael J. Nelson, playing a character called Mike Nelson, replaced him on the show as the human host until the end of the series. When Conniff left following the sixth season, Dr. Forrester was paired with his mother, Pearl Forrester, Mary Jo Pearl, for the seventh season. And then when he left MST3K in the seventh season and the show returned on the Shy-Fi channel, Bill Corbett took over as Crow while Pearl Forrester was promoted to lead Mad, aided by alien observer uh, Corbett and the anthropomorphic ape Professor Bobo, which was played by Kevin Murphy. Like, for me, that's my dream team because those were the episodes that I first started watching, but... There are other great, great, great episodes. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a little sound bite uh, from some of my favourite episodes in hopes that you might look them up on the internet and get into MST or riff tracking. It's so funny. It's so funny. So, episode recommendations. Manus, The Hands of Fate. Often described as the worst movie ever made. Don't actually think it deserves that title but it well no maybe it does judge for yourself and watch it Malice the Hands of Fate is a Z movie which was made because of a bet the cast and crew had no previous experience the camera that they used could only record for 30 seconds at a time and couldn't record sound making the entire film have to be dubbed over by no more than half a dozen people and one actor, who was supposed to be playing a satyr, had the metal rigging on his trousers back to front, making him look like a man with just lumpy knees. So here's a little sound clip from Manos. I am Torgo. I take care of the place while the master is away. Another great episode is The Sinister Urge. It's an Ed Wood movie, and it's one where the actor just... Uh, you might have heard the story about Ed Wood, but the actor just waves his gun around to see if Ed Wood noticed that he was doing that on the set during the film. He, he did not notice. He oh, I love this game. The sinister urge is a silly urge. The sinister urge is a stupid urge. Another favourite episode of mine is one called The Incredible Melting Man. During a space flight to Saturn, these astronauts are uh, three astronauts are exposed to a blast of radiation, which kills two of them and seriously injures the third, Steve West, whose skin starts melting. So he goes on a murder rampage. It's it's fantastic. It's All right, focus group. How many people here have heard of Mystery Science Theater 3000? By a show of hands, when, so all, all have heard of Mystery Science Theater 3000. And if you could have one film, what would that film be to uh, Gary? Yes. Incredible Melting Man, good. And 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 where would you like to see this? Uh, okay, film? people. Here's the long and the short of it. It's the Incredible Melting Man next time on Mystery Science Theater here at Comedy Central. And finally, for my episode recommendations, Puma Man. Puma Man is my favorite episode of all time of MST. The storyline is, thousands of years ago, an alien spaceship visited Earth and became a god to the Aztecs. The aliens fathered the Puma Man, a, a man god with supernatural powers who would guard the people of Earth and transmit his powers to his descendants. The original Puma Man was entrusted with a gold mask with the ability to control people's minds. It's even just thinking about it, it's cracking me up. Puma Man, he flies like a moron. He has the power to rear project major cities. So the song I'm going to actually play to represent MST, 3K, is a song that they sang during an episode of MST. Um, K 
Kevin Murphy has a reputation for creating little songs like the Puma Man song. And <clears throat> this is one of the ones that they sang. It's absolutely fantastic. I love it. Have it on my iPod. Yes, I'm that sad. So that was the song When I Held Your Brain in My Arms. And regular live listeners to the show will know that I play that song fairly often. So number six on my countdown for the best sci-fi shows set in space is number six, Star Trek, the original series. Star Trek was an American science fiction TV series created by Gene Roddenberry that follows the adventures of the starship the USS Enterprise, registration NCC-1701 and its crew. It later acquired the retronym of Star Trek, the original series, or simply TOS or TOS, to distinguish it from the show within media and the other franchises that it spun off. The series was produced from September 1966 to December 1967 by Desilu Productions, I think that's how you pronounce that, um, by Paramount Television from January 1968 to June 1969. Star Trek aired on NBC um, from 66 uh, to 69 and aired uh, from September on Canada's CTV network. Star Trek's Nielsen ratings while on NBC were low and the network cancelled it after three seasons and 79 episodes. On March 11th, 1964, Gene Roddenberry, a long-time fan of science fiction, drafted a short treatment for a science fiction TV show he called Star Trek. This was to be set on board a large intercellular spaceship in the 23rd century whose crew was dedicated to exploring a relatively small part of our galaxy, the Milky Way. Roddenberry had extensive experience in writing for series about the Old West that had been popular television fare in the 60s and 50s. Armed with this background, the first draft deliberately characterised the show as the wagon train to the stars. The series frequently included characters, usually security personnel, wearing red uniforms, who are killed or injured soon after their introduction. So prevalent was this plot device that it inspired the term red shirt to denote a stocked character whose purpose is to die violently to show the dangerous circumstances facing the main characters. Even as a kid, I was able to go, oh, that man, he's wearing a red shirt. He's going to die. Captain's Log, Stardate 8169.7. The Enterprise has just discovered a strange new planet in the Gamma Fallopia star system. Miss Sulu, ahead warp nine. All right, men, this is a dangerous mission, and it's likely one of us will be killed. The landing party will consist of myself, Mr. Spock, Dr. McCoy, and Ensign Ricky. Ah, oh, crap. In its writing, Star Trek is notable as one of the earliest science fiction TV series to use the services of leading contemporary science fiction writers such as Robert Bloch, Norman Spinrad, Harlan Ellison and Theodore Sturgeon, as well as established TV writers. Series script editor Dorothy C. Fontana, originally Roddenberry's secretary, played a key role in the success of Star Trek. She edited most of the scripts and wrote several successful episodes. Her credits read as D.C. Fontana at the suggestion of Roddenberry, who felt a female science fiction writer might not be taken seriously in a majority male field. Roddenberry often utilised the setting of a space vessel set many years in the future to comment on social issues of the 1960s United States, including sexism, racism, nationalism and global war. Sci-fi god Isaac Asimov and Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry developed a unique relationship during Star Trek's initial run in the late 1960s. Asimov wrote a critical essay on Star Trek's scientific accuracy for TV guides. Roddenberry retorted respectfully with a personal letter explaining the limitations of accuracy when writing a weekly series. Asimov corrected himself with a follow-up essay in TV Guide, claiming, despite its inaccuracies, that Star Trek was a fresh, intellectually challenging science fiction television show. The two remained friends to the point where Asimov even served as an advisor on a number of Star Trek projects. Um, it's interesting to note that, you know, some of the stuff that they covered on the show, which, such as sexism, um, was very rife at the time. The original pilot of the, the first episode of Star Trek had... Michael Barrett, who Michael Barrett, rather Radio and Barrett's wife, was actually the number one officer, and she had a much smaller role in the retailed pilot. But 
when they made the animated series, um, the actors absolutely fought to voice their own parts. The network just wanted some stand-in actors to voice the characters of like Chekhov, Sulu, Uhura, and uh, William Shatner, Leonard Nimoy put their feet down. They said, we all do it or none of us do it. Um, that was because, you know, in the days before William Shatner became the big head. Um, from the back of Star Trek came Star Trek the Animated Series, or TAS, um, which is canon. Ignore anyone who says it's not canon. It is canon. It was voiced by all the actors. It was written by all the writers, and they considered it canon. And six full feature films with the original Enterprise crew. Star Trek The Motion Picture, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, Star Trek III, The Search for Spock, Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, Star Trek V, the one Star Trek fans like to pretend doesn't exist, and Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, which is probably my personal favourite. This is not Klingon blood. New series followed with The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Enterprise, and the new series that I am so excited about will debut in January 2017, as well as four Next Generation set movies. Um, but let's not talk about Abrams. That's not Star Trek. That was, of course, Leonard Nimoy's brilliant song, Bill Bo Baggins. Comments, queries, suggestions. You can follow me on Twitter at Airtime Geek or Instagram at Airtime of the Geek. You can email me, Paula B, at ignitionradio.co.uk or you can call into the studio. The number's 01642 645 827. We're continuing on with my list of the top 10 sci-fi shows set in space. And at number five is Red Dwarf. Red Dwarf is a British sci-fi comedy series which began in 1988 and has ran on and off ever since. It is almost unique in it that is one of the extremely rare sci-fi shows set in space that is set in the future and does not feature aliens. Everything encountered by the crew has origins from Earth. The main setting of the series is the eponymous mining ship Red Dwarf, which is six miles long and is operated by the Jupiter Mining Corporation. In the first episode, set sometime in the late 22nd century, an onboard radiation leak of Cadmium-2 kills everyone except for the lowest-ranking technician Dave Lister, played by Craig Charles, who is suspended in animation at the time. His pregnant cat Frankenstein, who is safely sealed in the cargo hold, following the accident, the ship's computer hollow keeps a uh, holly keeps Lister in stasis until the background radiation dies down, a process that takes three million years. Lister therefore emerges as the last human being in the universe, but not alone on board his ship. His former bunkmate and immediate superior, Arnold Judas Rimmer, played by Chris Barry, is resurrected by Holly as a hologram to keep Lister sane. At the same time, a creature known only as Cat, played by Danny John Jules, is the last member on board of Felis Sapiens, a race of humanoid felines that evolved in the ship's hold from Lister's cat, Frankenstein, and her kittens during the three million years that Lister was in stasis. Later, the crew added a mechanoid, Crichton, first played by David Ross, then Robert Llewellyn took over the part, and Holly's ship's computer had a sex change operation and went from being played by Norman Lovett to Hattie Hayridge. The cast were primarily not actors. Craig Charles was a punk poet, Danny John Joe was a dancer, Chris Barry was largely an impressionist who worked on Spitting Image, and Norman Lovett was a stand-up comedian. Uh, Rimmer was very almost played by Alfred Molina, who was famous for playing Doc Ock in Spider-Man 2. And Alan Rickman also auditioned for a part. Can you imagine a world of Red Dwarf with Alan Rickman in it? The US has tried making a version for themselves twice with two failed pilots. The first saw Hinton Battle try to take the role of the cat and the second Terry Farrell of Star Trek Deep Space Nine fame with Robert Llewellyn replacing the role of Crichton and Jane Leaves, a.k.a. Daphne Moon from Frasier, taking the part of Holly. Craig Charles reportedly said, where are all the black people? After watching the pilot, as the parts of Lister and Cat had both been recast with white actors during the second pilot. The show was created by Rob Grant and Doug Naylor. Grant left the show in 1995, leaving Naylor to go it alone, and the split became very obvious in the writing. 
as Nerla's style was more comedic and Grant's style was more sci-fi, and without the other to balance each other out, the show dipped in quality. Since its revival on Dave, however, moving on from the BBC, it's been far better received and indeed feels more like the Red Dwarf of old. When it first appeared on TV, I actually refused to watch it as a child because I thought it was about a scary red gnome type creature and my dad didn't bother to explain it to me until it was in its fourth season. Once I actually started watching it, I loved it. Um, Mark Williams, to me, is not Mr Weasley. He's Olaf Peterson. Mac McDonald, no matter what he turns up in, Aliens, Batman, he's Captain Hollister. I grew up on this show and it helped shape the very way my brain works. Several of the novels have audiobook versions narrated by Chris Barry, who can impersonate the other ca members of cast very well and they are well worth a listen. What I'm going to play is the famous song from Red Dwarf, Tongue Tied. Number four on my list of the top ten sci-fi shows set in space is... Lex. The main characters of the series are the Lex and its crew. The crew consists of the captain of the Lex, Stanley H. Tweedle of Planet Ostro B, security guard fourth class and the arch traitor, assistant deputy backup courier of a failed rebellion. The love slave Zev as of Planet B3K, part cluster lizard and part renegade love slave, played by Lisa Hines as original Zev before the transformation, then by Eva Haberman as Zev in the first um, two episodes of the second season. And then Xenia Seberg, who Zev, and it's pronounced the exact same way, but then it's spelt with an X because her name is Xenia. Um, the undead former assassin Kai, the last of the Brun and Chi. And the love crazed robot head 790, a robot head that received the love slave programming meant for Zev. In, f in first love with Zev and then starting in season three with Kai. Together they are looking for a new home. The background conflict of the series is a war between mankind and the insect civilization, in which each side seeks to annihilate the other. It was foretold to Kai that one day he will destroy the last remnant of the insect civilization. Then there is Laika, a plant who can also release an apparent human woman form to feed on humans. She sleeps of long periods of time aboard the Lex and is an occasional Lex crew member when she wakes up to release her human form. She appeared in 10 episodes. The plot unfolds over a time span of 6,000 years. Kai's death or undeath occurs 2,008 years before the beginning of events of the series. For the first two seasons, each episode is focused on space travel and usually one different planet. Each um, of the last two seasons as a single location for all episodes. At the beginning of season three, the crew spends about 4,000 years in cryostasis, and then in season four, the Lex reaches our Earth in the present. In season one, Stan, Zev, and Kai accidentally steal the Lex, the most powerful destructive weapon in the two universes. After successfully fleeing from the cluster, the main planet of the League of 20,000 Planets, they are looking for a new home. Kai needs proto-blood to live outside of his cryo-chamber. Looking for proto-blood, the Lex returns to the cluster to learn that a huge insect survived. This insect has controlled the Divine Order and his Divine Shadow in order to eat all human inhabitants of the 20,000 planets. The insect then begins a metamorphosis into the Giga Shadow. The Giga Shadow produces proto-blood. With the help of Zev, Kai manages to fill up the store of proto-blood. Kai places the cluster lizard squish in the brain of the insect and thus is able to destroy it. The main conflict of the second season is the fight against Mantrid. The actor, Dieter Lesa, is now more known for playing the Mad Doctor in Human Centipede. Mantrid is a formal bio vizier of his divine shadow. The crew inadvertently help him transfer his mind into a machine in the first episode of that season, while accidentally fusing it with the remnants of his shadow. Mantrid's goal is to transform all matter in the light universe into Mantrid drones. In the meantime, the crew keeps getting into difficult situations and is usually rescued by Kai. At the end of the season, they destroy Mantrid. Unfortunately, the light universe is also destroyed, so the crew flees to the Dark Zone. The third season sees Lex running out of food and must fly slowly to conserve energy. 790 computes that it might take thousands of years to reach an inhabited planet, so the crew enters cryostasis to survive the voyage. 
After 4,000 years in cryostasis, they reach the twin planets of fire and water, and the entire third season takes part on these two planets. The crew meet people they knew from the light universe, and these survivors cannot remember their past in the parallel universe, though their personalities are still the same. Fire is ruled by the charismatic prince. Water doesn't seem to have a ruler. The inhabitants of both planets live in isolated towns. On water, they live on islands in a huge ocean, and on fire, there are big towers separated by desert. Prince wants to win the crew over to his side, especially Zev. He tests their sense of morality through various temptations, and the crew are frequently separated and forced to act individually. After jumping from the Lex to the surface of water, Kai has trouble functioning normally without the killer crew members. On water, deep beneath its surface, Kai encounters his soul essence, which awaits rebirth. Stanley dies, and a trial is held over the destination of his soul. All his bad decisions are weighted against his good deeds, and he is sentenced to eternal punishment on fire. At the end of the season, both planets, fire and water, are destroyed, and Sandstall is set free, and is able to return to his body, though he cannot remember what happened to him on fire. The souls of all the inhabitants on water and fire are also released and then travel to a planet that looks very much like Earth. In its final season, when Lex travels to Earth looking for food, it's located in the very centre of the Dark Universe and the crew assumes it must be a very dangerous place. The crew again meet people they knew from the Light Universe and from fire and water. Only Prince and Priest are able to remember their lives on fire, though presumably Priest can only do this because Prince allows him to. Kai's soul is stuck because he is undead and he decides to die to release his soul. To do this, he must regain his mortality. He plays chess with Prince to win his mortality, but remains undead. The Earth is threatened by a being who resembles Laika. The crew find out that the fake Laika destroyed all human life on her way through the Dark Zone. Kai decides to destroy the asteroid that is the source of the entity. Prince keeps his promise and restores, restores Kai's morality, and then 15 minutes later, Kai dies. Uh, it's really, really sad, and that's why I don't rewatch really watch the fourth season episode. Um, so at the end, uh, San, uh, Stan and Zev fly off together on Lef's, Lex's offspring, a little Lex, because the main Lex dies from very, very old age. Over the course of its run, Lex featured a variety of guest stars, such as Tim Curry, Barry Bostwick, um, the episodes were weird in a sort of very delightfully confusing way. Um, there were two episodes which I, I hadn't watched the second one of them because they were called uh, The Web and The Snare. Or, and uh, they were basically exactly the same except for little things. And it drove me crazy. I actually thought I was watching the same episode twice. And it wasn't until a friend of mine pointed out that actually it's that there is differences that I went, oh, I better go watch that episode then. Um some parts of the internet know the actor Steve McCatty for his famous appearance on Star Trek Deep Space Nine and his quote, it's a fake. Greetings. It's a fake. But I will always associate him with his appearance on Lex. And my favourite, every time I see him, we, we end up quoting this. Greetings. From the children of the planet... Potato hole. This is a potato. It is a symbol of the fertile soil of our beautiful planet. I am E.J. Moss, captain of the Eagle Five. And uh, this is uh, L.L. Bush. He is the science officer. And this is P.T. Bando. He is the, uh, the flight officer, the flight officer, navigator. We can understand you. Mm. You can? Yes, we can. Lex's Legacy left um, a great series. It was funny, it was dark, it was weird, it was twisted. They did a variety of different things, and one of which was a musical episode. So the song I'm going to play to represent Lex is from the musical episode. It's one of my favourites. It's the song of the time, Prophet. So, number three. We're getting into the big ones now. Number three is Star Trek The Next Generation. 
I remember when I was a small child and it was announced that a new Star Trek show was due to air and I was furious that someone had dared to make a new Star Trek TV show, even though I was only about five at the time. Um, of course, once it actually went to air, I saw it and loved it. Um, often referred to as Next Gen or TNG, the series follows the adventures of a spacefaring crew aboard the Starship Enterprise, the USS Enterprise, of course, NCC 1701-D, the fifth Federation vessel to bear the name and registry and the seventh starship of that name. The series is set about 70 years after the final mission of the original Enterprise crew under the command of James T. Kirk. The Federation has undergone massive internal changes in its quest to explore and seek out new life, adding new degrees of complexity, complexity and controversy to its methods, especially those focused on the Prime Directive. The Klingon Empire and the United Federation of Planets have ceased wartime hostilities and have become galactic allies, with more sinister forces such as the Romulans and the Borg taking precedence on the series. The Enterprise is commanded by Captain Jean-Luc Picard, the most Yorkshire Frenchman I've ever heard in my life. Honestly, there's a drinking game where you count the number of times that Captain Picard says the word grand. It's more than what you'd think. Um, it's staffed by the first officer, Commander William Riker, second officer and operations manager, Data, security chief, Chief Tasha Yar, Ship's Counselor Deanna Troy, and Chief Medical Officer Dr. Beverly Crusher. Con Officer Geordie LaForge, and Junior Officer Lieutenant Worf. The absolutely shocking death of Lieutenant Yar in the first series prompted an internal shuffle of personnel, making Worf Chief of Security, and Geordie is promoted to Chief Engineer at the beginning of Season 2, which is brilliant that they actually gave him a proper job to do, because before that, he was just kind of wandering about the bridge a lot. Another Star Trek drinking game, play Spot the Leader Alexander, because she turns up a lot. The series begins with the crew of the Enterprise D put on trial by a nefarious, omnipotent being known as Q. The godlike entity threatens the extinction of mankind for being a race of savages, forcing them to solve a mystery at nearby Farpoint Station to prove their worthiness to be spared. After successfully solving the mystery and avoiding disaster, the crew officially departs on its mission to explore strange new worlds. Subsequent stories focus on the discovery of new life, sociology, uh, political relationships with alien cultures, as well as exploring the human condition. Several new species are introduced as recurring antagonists, including the Ferengi, the Cardassians and the Borg. Through their adventures, Picard and his crew are often forced to face and live with all the consequences of their difficult choices. The series ended in its seventh season with a two-part All Good Things, which brought the events of the series full circle to the original confrontation with Q. An interstellar anomaly that threatens all life in the universe forces Picard to leap from his present, past and future to combat the threat. Picard was successfully able to show Q that humanity could think outside the confines of its perception and theorise new possibilities while still being prepared to sacrifice themselves for the greater good. The series ended with the crew of the Enterprise portrayed as feeling more like a family and paved the way for four consecutive motion pictures that continued the theme and the mission of the series. The next generation included several guest characters who appeared in later iterations of Star Trek and also introduced characters who appeared in later spin-offs and films. James Dewant, Forrest Kelly, Mark Leonard, Leonard Nimoy all appeared as the original Star Trek characters, Montgomery Scott, Leonard McCoy, Sarek and Spock respectively. Merrick Buttrick, Robin Curtis, Judson Scott, David Warner and Paul Winfield played characters in various Star Trek films and later had roles in Next Generation, in fact, David Warner was in two separate Star Trek films as two completely different characters because he's David Warner and that's how he rolls. Additionally, Alexander Siddig and Armin Shimmerman played their Deep Space Nine characters Julian Bashir and Quark in episodes of The Next Generation before being cast in Deep Space Nine. Shimmerman had played several Ferengi characters in Next Gen. Jennifer Hetrick played Vash, Barbara Mush Lursa, Richard Pope Evek and Winneth Walsh Bittor reprised their Next Generation characters on Deep Space Nine. Several actors who appeared in Next Gen later played roles in, in the rest of the franchise. These include 
Robert Duncan McNeil, Ethan Phillips and Tim Ross, who played Tom Paris Neelix and Two Rock, respectively, on Voyager. Salman Jens and James Sloyland appeared in an episode of Next Gen before landing recurring roles in Deep Space Nine. Susie Plaxon and Tony Todd also appeared in Next Gen and they later played roles on both Deep Space Nine and Voyager. Mark Alamo, who depicted one of the franchise's first Cardassians in The Next Generation, later played Cardassian Gull to Cat throughout Deep Space Nine's seven seasons. Like Armin Shimmerman, Max Grudchik played a Ferengi in The Next Gen before being recast as a recurring Ferengi, Rom, in Deep Space Nine. Emmy Award winner James Cromwell appeared twice in The Next Generation. He played Zephram Cochran in the second Next Generation film, First Contact. Other notable guest stars in the show include Eva Anderson, Billy Campbell, Nicky Cox, Ronnie Cox, Olivia Rabu, Kirsten Dunst, Mick Fleetwood, Matt Frewer, the brilliant Matt Frewer, Walter Gottel, Git Kelsey Grammer, Bob Gunton, Terry Hatcher, Stephen Hawking, yes, that's Stephen Hawking, Famke Jensen, Mae Jennison, Ken Jenkins, Ashley Judd, Sabrina LaBeouf, Christopher MacDonald, Babe Newworth, Terry O'Quinn, Michelle Phillips, Gina Revere, Gene Simmons, Paul Savino, Brenda Strong, James Worthy, Tracy Walter, Liz Vahey, David Ogden Steers, Ray Wise and John Tesh. The Next Generation's average of 20 million viewers often exceeded and both existing syndications successful such as Wheel of Fortunes and other network hits including Cheers and LA Law, benefiting in part from the many stations' decision to air each new episode twice in a week. It consistently ranked in the top 10 hour-long dramas and networks could not prevent affiliates from preempting their shows with The Next Gen or other dramas that Im immediately syndicated strategy. Next Gen received 18 Emmy Awards and in its seventh season became the first and only television show to be nominated for the Emmy for Best Dramatic Series. It was nominated for three Hugo Awards and won two. The first season episode, The Big Goodbye, also won the Peabody Award for Excellence in Television Programming. Four feature films of the characters of the series, Star Trek Generations in 94, Star Trek First Contact in 96, Insurrection in 98 and Star Trek Nemesis in 2002. The original version of the Starfleet uniform was very uncomfortable for the actors and Patrick Stewart told this story on an episode of The Kamars at number 42. It had to lead to a change of design from a one-piece to a two-piece outfit in season three. Although the uniforms were easiest to wear, the jackets had a tendency to ride up. And when the actors were sitting down, Patrick Stewart got into the habit of straightening his jacket with a sharp downward tug as soon as he stood up. An action that later became known through the cast and crew as the Picard manoeuvre. So what I'm going to play to represent next gen is Brent Spiner singing Blue Skies. Number two on my countdown of the top ten sci-fi shows set in space is Babylon 5. 110 episodes, six TV movies make up the oeuvre of Babylon 5, J. Michael Straczynski's epic sci-fi show. What tragic trivia fact links Babylon 5 with Star Trek the original series? Despite a 30-year difference in airing, they both have four main cast members now deceased. Leonard Nimoy, James Dewan, DeForest Kelly and Michael Barrett Roddenberry are sadly no longer with us. But the most younger cast has the same amount of losses with Richard Briggs, who played Dr. Stephen Franklin, Andreas Katsoulis, who played Jakar, Michael O'Hare, who played the ship's first captain, Jeffrey Sinclair, and Jeff Conaway, who played security chief, Zach Allen, have all tragically passed away as well. Set between the years of 2257 and 2262, it depicts a future where Earth has sovereign states and a unifying Earth government. Colonies within the solar system and beyond make up the Earth Alliance and contact has been made with other space-faring species. The ensemble cast portray alien ambassadorial staff and humans assigned to the five-mile-long Babylon 5 space station, a centre for trade and diplomacy. Described as one of the most complex programmes on television, the various story arcs drew upon the prophecies, religious solitary and racial tensions, social pressures, political rivalries which existed within each of their cultures to create a contextual framework for the motivations and consequences of the protagonist's actions. 
At the beginning of the series, five dominant civilizations are represented. The dominant species are the humans, the Mimbari, the Narn, the Centauri, and the Volons. The Shadows and their various allies are malevolent species who appear later in the series. Several dozen less powerful species from the League of Non-Aligned Worlds also appear, including the Drazi, the Bakari, the Vri, the Markab, and the Pakmara. The station's first three predecessors, the original Babylon Station, the Babylon 2 and the Babylon 3, were sabotaged or accidentally destroyed before their completion. The fourth station, the Babylon 4, vanished without a trace 24 hours before it officially became operational. The television series takes its name from the Babylon 5 space station, located in the Epsilon Eridani star system at the fifth Langerian point between the fictional planet Epsilon 3 and its moon. Babylon 5 is an O'Neill cylinder five miles long and half a mile to a mile in diameter. Living area accommodates various alien species, providing different atmospheres and gravities. Human visitors to the alien sectors are shown using breathing equipment and other measures to tolerate the conditions. The five seasons of each series correspond to one fictional sequential year in the period between 2258 and 2262. Each season shares its name with an episode that is central to the season's plot. As the series starts, the Babylon station is welcoming ambassadors from various races to the galaxy. Earth has just barely survived an accidental war with the much more powerful Minbari, who, despite their technological superior, uh, superiority, mysteriously surrender at the brink of destruction of the human race during the Battle of the Line. During 2258, Commander Geoffrey Sinclair is in charge of the station. Much of the story revolves around his gradual discovery that it was his capture by the Mimbari at the Battle of the Line which ended the war against Earth. Upon capturing Sinclair, the Mimbari came to believe that Valen, a great Mimbari leader and hero of the last Mimbari Shadow War, had been reincarnated as the commander. Concluding that others of their species had been and were continuing to be reborn as humans, and in obedience with the edict that Minbari do not kill one another, lest they harm the soul, they stopped the war just as Earth's final defences were on the verge of collapse. Meanwhile, tensions between the Centauri Republic, which is an empire in decline, and the Nan regime, a former dominion which rebelled and gained freedom, are increasing. Ambassador Dakar of the Nan wishes for his people to strike back at the Centauri for what they did, and Ambassador Londo Malari of the Centauri wishes for his people to become again the great empire they once were. As part of these struggles, Malari makes a deal with a mysterious ally to strike back at the Nan, further heightening tensions. It is gradually revealed that, that Ambassador Delen is a member of a mysterious, powerful Grey Council, the ruling body of the Mimbari, and towards the end of 2258, she begins the transformation into a Mimbari-human hybrid, ostensibly to build a bridge between the humans and the Mimbari. The year ends with the death of the Earth Alliance president, Luis Santago, and the death is officially ruled as an accident, but some members of the military, including the staff of the Babylon 5, believe it to be an assassination. Substance abuse and its impact on human personalities also plays a significant role in the Babylon 5 storyline. The station security chief, Michael Garibaldi, is a textbook relapsing, remitting alcoholic of the binge drinking type. He practices complete abstinence from alcohol throughout most of the series, with one notable exception, until the middle of season 5. He only recovers physically and socially and breaks the cycle at the end of the season. His eventual replacement as Chief of Security, Zach Allen, was given a second chance by Garibaldi after overcoming his own addiction to an unspecified drug. Dr Stephen Franklin develops initially unrecognised addiction to injectable stimulant drugs while trying to cope with the chronic stress and work overload in the med lab and wanders off to the homeless and deprived in the Brown sector, where he suffers through a series of withdrawal symptoms. Executive Officer Susan Ivanova mentions her father became an alcoholic after her mother committed suicide after having been drugged by authorities over a number of years. Captain Elizabeth Lockley, who takes over as the final captain, tells Garibaldi that her father was an alcoholic and that she is herself a now recovering alcoholic. These weren't just the only issues that were covered on the show. Um, Michael Straczynski once said in an interview that he doesn't believe in writing about what you know. He writes about things that you don't know. Uh, he himself is an atheist, so he writes about the Mimbari, who are deeply religious and believe in souls, and who can forgive 
he says he can't forgive. If someone kills another person, that's that person gone forever, and he can't forgive that. But the Mimbari can't. There was one particular episode which really strikes out in my memory, where a man has been uh, reconditioned. He'd, he'd committed a murder, and his memory had been completely wiped and given a new set of memories. He was a completely different person, and he was a really nice person, nice did nice things and everyone liked him and a man who recognised him from his old self killed him and it makes you really upset because this man being killed he didn't do anything and then we see that the, the guy who killed the nice man has then himself been re um, given a new set of memories and his personality had been wiped and he again he's become a different person it was a really really interesting way of sort of covering this corporal punishment idea originally JMS said that Michael O'Hare was replaced in the show due to his realisation that the character had too much waited upon him. Um, he said that Jeffrey Sinclair was released, uh, replaced and uh, it was too much for his character to do. Uh, this is not true. After O'Hare's death, uh, which was very, very tragic, the truth came out. And what I shall do is let the man himself explain what happened. This has never been discussed anywhere until this moment. Into the first year of working with Michael, I began to notice problems. Good guy, good actor, but there were things happening that I couldn't account for in behaviorally. And about halfway through, I asked him to come in, we talked, seemed fine, back to work. And end of the day, we talked to him again when he was more tired. And he began to manifest symptoms of psychosis where he talked about looking for messages to him in the papers that he was that the FBI was following him that he was getting secret messages in television programs and I realized he was heading for a psychotic break my psychology background came into play and I didn't know what to do because when he was they were most of the time he was fine but every so often, under stress, out would come delusional behavior. Oh, what do I do? What do I do? My first show, first season, if I tell Warners about this, they'll pull the plug. And I finally decided I'm going to tell Warners. I have to. I talked to Michael. I said, you know, we need to get you. We don't have the power to force you to get medication. But <clears throat> I can stop this so you can get the care you need. He says, don't do it. Don't do it. I can't be responsible for the show shutting down, everyone losing their jobs. I can get through this. If you help me, I can get through this. And I said, if you really want a chance, I'll give you that chance. We're going to assign someone to work with you and keep an eye on you. The moment the needle goes into the red, we're pulling the plug. I understand that. He said, I understand. I will work with you. We'll make this happen. And he held on by his fingernails for that season. I could see the strain it was taking on him, the toll it was taking, but he held on. And I was at any moment prepared to pull the trigger on this thing. He finished the season up, and I pulled him into the office. I said, you and I both know this is getting worse. You both know you're not going to make it to another season if, if things as way they are. I'm going to move on from you as the commander of the station. Don't worry about it. Whatever your rent needs are for the while, I'll take care of it. Food, I got to cover it. We will get you treatment. We will get you better. And I spent the next year or so working with him and to a degree with his family to get him the care that he needed while we brought on Sheridan to say that role. And <clears throat> got him the proper meds. It was a long process of getting it worked out. Um, in the next year, I said, can you come back to do a two part. We kept the secret because they wanted to kill his career. <clears throat> and got him to a point where he could now come back and do a two parter to close off that arc and introduce the notion of him being Valen. And we finished the episode. And he, as we're sitting in the office, um, I said, We're going to keep working with you and make this better. And I'll keep the secret to my, my grave. He says, You don't have to. He says, Look, keep it to, keep it to my grave. Because if anything ever happens to me, I want people to know that this is a problem, and here's why I left. Because people need to know that there's a problem in their family. 
if, it, if, it, if this can happen to a, an actor, a star of a show, a commander of a station, it can happen to anyone, and it's not a scandalous thing. It can be dealt with. So if anything ever happens to me, I want you to be free to talk about this. So we'll talk about it. you got to live all of us. So, yeah. And <clears throat> in the years that pass, he, got, he stayed on the bed. So he got married. He had a kid. He started to get his acting career back together. For reasons unknown, he fell off the meds, and the fall was hard. We tried to keep in touch with him. He just disappeared off the grid and ended up in a um, halfway house under medication. And just this past year, passed away from a heart attack. And when I go to this convention in Phoenix in about a week and a half, I will be telling that story for the first time ever. It's so tragic. It's we lost a number of cast members from the show, and that one was the most tragic because he fought so hard to make that work and to come back, and it's a terrible loss. So that was J. Michael Straczynski telling the story of what happened to Michael O'Hare. So it's time for my number one sci-fi show set in space. And perhaps if you're listening, you might have guessed this already. If you know me, you've definitely guessed it already. My number one is Star Trek Deep Space Nine. DS9 is the fourth show in the Star Trek franchise. It centers formally on the former Cardassian space station Terok-Nor after the Bajorans have liberated themselves from the long and brutal Cardassian occupation. The United Federation of Planets is invited by the Bajoran Provisional Government to administer joint control of the station, which initially orbits Bajor. The station is renamed Deep Space Nine. It's my favourite Star Trek. It has all my favourite characters and my favourite race, the Cardassians. The setting of the show, a station that, rather than a starship, fostered a rich assortment of recurring characters. It was not unheard of for secondary characters to play much of a huge role in an episode as the regular cast, if not more. For example, The Wire focused almost entirely on Elim Garrick, while Treachery, Faith and the Great River focused on Wayun, and a secondary plot centred on Nog in It's Only a Paper Moon relied on Nog and holographic crooner Vic Fontaine to carry the story. Several Cardassian figures preach prominently in DS9, particularly Gul'du Katz, the main villain of the series, played by Mark Alamo. A complex character, he undergoes several transformations before ultimately becoming profoundly evil and Cisco's arch enemy by the show's conclusion. A Star Trek.com article about Star Trek's greatest villains once described Gul'du Katz as possibly the most complex and fully developed bad guy in Star Trek history. I would disagree with that and say he is possibly the most complex and fully developed bad guy in all history. Elam Garrick, portrayed by Andrea Robinson, is the only Cardassian who remains on the station in exile when the Federation and Bajorans take over. Wildly suspected of being on the station as a spy of the Obsidian Order, the feared Cardassian secret police, he maintains that he is merely a simple tailor. Garrick's skills and contacts on Cardassia prove invulnerable, invaluable on several occasions, and he becomes a pivotal figure in the war with the Dominion. Jeffrey Coombs of Reanimator fame has stated that he auditioned for the role of William Riker on Star Trek The Next Generation, but when Jonathan Frakes, who won the part, later directed the DS9 episode Meridian, he recommended Coombs for a part. Coombs made his Star Trek and DS9 debut as a one-episode alien named Turon, before being cast as the Ferengi Brunt and Vota Weyoun. He would later go on to appear in 31 episodes of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, playing four distinct characters, five if one counts the Mirror of the Universe version of Brunt. In The Dogs of War, he also became one of the few Star Trek actors to play two distinct roles, Brunt and Weyoun, in the same episode. He also appeared in the series Star Trek Enterprise as the Indorian Commander Shran, and he is one of the few people to have appeared in three of the four modern Star Trek series. More plot-based than other Treks, and I don't actually want to discuss the plot or the development of the characters too much in case you haven't seen it and wish to watch it, as would be utterly awful to ruin the surprises for any new watcher. In the first episode, Commander... Benjamin Sisko arrives with his young son, Jake, at Deep Space Nine. Um, 
he is assigned to run the station jointly with the newly liberated Bajorans as they recover from the Cardassian operation to pave the way for Brajor's entry into the Federation. Sisko and Jadzia Dax stumble across the first stable wormhole ever found and discover that its inhabitants um, are beings who are not bound by space or time. To the strongly religious people of Bajor, the wormhole aliens are their gods, the prophets, and the wormhole itself is the long prophesied celestial temple where they reside. Sisko himself is hailed as emissary of the prophets, though whom the prophets primarily ask, act. This provides a basis for a long-lasting story arc. Sisko initially considers his role as a religious icon with open discomfort and scepticism, referring to the prophets simply as wormhole aliens and striving to keep his role as commander of the station distinct from any religious obligations that the Bajorans tried to place upon him. Later, he becomes much more of accepting of his role and by the end of the series, openly embraces it. Deep Space Nine was well received by critics with TV Guide describing it as the best acted, written and produced altogether finest Star Trek TV series. The reason it's my favourite... I would agree. It's the long developed, uh, long running story arcs, characterization, fully fleshed out villains. They didn't have time to do that on next gen. They were moving from place to place to place to place. They didn't have time for recurring villains. They didn't have time for long running story arcs. It was kind of, that was the trekking part. If you wanted sort of the trekking and the adventure, you watched next gen. And if you wanted storylines and developed characters, you watched Deep Space Nine. So that was my top 10 sci-fi shows set in space. Comments, queries, suggestions, you can follow me on Twitter at Airtime Geek or Instagram at Airtime of the Geek. You can email me, paulab at ignitionradio.co.uk or you can call in the studio, it's 01642 645 827. So last weekend I just dragged and I mean dragged my bestie to see High Rise, a film based on a novel of the same name by J.G. Ballard. Mainly my interest in the movie extended to the fact that Reece Shearsmith of League of Gentlemen was in it and Tom Hiddleston being nude helped matters a great deal. I went into the movie with no expectations, having only seen the trailer and knowing nothing about the book. And what I can say about the movie is that Tom Hiddleston is a very attractive man with a very attractive body and you can see most of it in the trailer. There is no need, there is no reason to sit through High Rise to see any more of it. The first half of the movie is a very British dark comedy in the vein of something like The Cottage. Uh, the second half of the movie is a confused, weird mess, which had I actually been high might have made more sense. And before anyone writes in about this, no, it's not art house. It's not Dada. It's too normal to be Dada. I'm going to tell you the plot because honestly, it's not like spoilers would actually spoil anything. Set in the futuristic past of the 1970s. Hiddles plays Dr. Robert Lang, a new resident of a high-rise tower block whose sister has just died. Not that that plays any bearing on the plot. The movie opens with Hiddles digging through bags of rubbish and running into Reese Shearsmith inside the tower block in some sort of post-apocalyptic-like setting. He comes across a dog who he pets and takes in and then we see him roasting its leg on his balcony. The film cuts to three months earlier. He makes friends with some people in the building and sunbathes and naked on the terrace, which is extremely strange, given that this film is set in England and we have but three hours of summer on any given year. He gets invited to a party and has a nice time and then had some rather loud sex with his upstairs neighbour. Hiddles then gets invited to an upstairs party at the penthouse where everyone is very snobby and I imagine that the point is supposed to be that even though he's a doctor, Hiddles best fits in with the lower floor residents. The penthouse has a garden on the top which houses, amongst other things, a goat and a horse. Not that that has any bearing on the plot. One of his students at the hospital he teaches at is an upper floor resident who is obnoxious. So he plays a prank on him, telling him that they found something vague in a brain scan. The student then kills himself. Not that that has any bearing on the plot. Uh, this is the point of the movie where it stops being darkly funny and just starts being weird as hell. The entire tower block goes collectively mad as the power flicks on and off. The supermarket inside the building stops getting fresh food and goes rotten. The residents fight and kill one another, dumping bodies in the pool. No one leaves the building. Even though they can. 
There's nothing stopping them from leaving the building, but they all start eating dogs and dog food. Bear in mind, they can totally leave the building. There is nothing stopping them. Luke Evans plays a character who is cheating on his pregnant wife with anything that moves throughout the film. Then he goes around raping people and beating them up, including Sienna Miller. Hiddle sleeps with his pregnant wife and has a jolly nice time, even though he's covered himself in grey paint. The owner of the building gets killed and things seem to return to some sort of sanity, but not. I'd have said it was a metaphor for Hiddleston's character losing his mind, but we see scenes that he's not involved in, where other people are acting just as mental. I've seen reviews where people have called the film ingenious and surrealist. It's not surrealist. It's not surrealist to see a man doing a very bad job of painting this flat. It's just weird. It's too normal to be surrealist. Some people have said that the original novel is a commentary on consumerism and the lower floors try desperately to claw their way to the top, drowning dogs and raping women on the way. Perhaps audiences coming out of a triple dip recession with things to worry about like climate change, ever-growing arguments over migration, the constant threat of terrorism, don't want to sit through a two-hour movie whose message is tying them off for wanting nice things. All in all, I gave this movie a three out of ten. Two points of that were allotted to Tom Hiddleston's bottom. Tom Hiddleston is a delightful actor and I perhaps would have loved to see seen a movie when he and Rhys Smith try to get along in an abandoned tower block going mad in a post-apocalyptic world but honestly they, they could have left at any time and nothing was stopping them except the, themselves which makes this movie a stinking pile of BS. It just raises too many questions. That's it for this week's Airtime of the Geek. Tune in next week for more Top 10s news and reviews. Comments, queries, suggestions, you can follow me at Airtime Geek on Twitter or Instagram, Airtime of the Geek. You can email me, Paula B, at ignitionradio.co.uk. You can call in the studio, 01642 645 827. You can also follow me on DeviantArt. My name on there is Airtime Geek. That's it for me for this week and Simon will be taking over this afternoon.